In this Northern Brewer video, a meet and greet with bootleg biology. We talk with the lab's chief yeast wrangler about the company's history, expansive strain selection, and what home brewers should be fermenting with bootleg biology yeast strains now available at Northern Brewer. What's going on everybody? Chip Walton, I'm here in Northern Brewer. I am joined by bootleg biology founder and CEO, Jeff Mello. Hello, Jeff Mello. <laughs> How are you doing, brother? Good, man. How are you? I am doing well. I'm excited as heck to have bootleg biology now kind of carried in our, our yeast lineup. Um, everything from clean to hazy, unique blends, of course, a little funk, which we'll talk about. But there's mm -hmm. really something for everybody in this collection. Um, we're going to talk about the portfolio in just a minute. But first, super excited. You guys are uh, celebrating 10 years in the yep. yeast wrangling business. Uh, and I want to kind of take people back just in case they don't know the story of bootleg biology. Who are y'all and how did you get to where we are in 2023? <laughs> Thanks for that awesome intro. Um, well, we are a yeast lab, full service yeast lab um, based in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, we sell to home brewers, also to professional brewers. Um, our goal since day one is kind of just to make unique cultures, find unique cultures. And the reason that was is because bootlegs started in my kitchen. I was living in the DC area. Um, I happened to read an article written by Mike Tunsmeyer, one of my personal heroes, the mad fermentationist, um, about finding wild yeast outside. And that really just sparked a fire in me. And I did some fun experiments and they all were terrible, but um, with some uh, strategic research, um, kind of self-taught myself to uh, isolate yeast strains. And our first strain ever um, is ARL. And that was something I found in my backyard. Um, and that really kind of inspired me to share the techniques that I used for bootleg. Um, like I, I didn't have a background in science in any way. Um, and I was, I was like, so if I can do it, anyone can do it. Um, and so I was like, all right, bootleg biology. This is the epitome of biology. We're bootlegging it. We're not spending a lot of money, not a lot of expensive <laughs> equipment, maybe not even a whole lot of expertise at the time. <laughs> um, and then I was like, well, why don't I encourage other people to do this and then start a bank? And then, you know, little by little, I was like, oh, I think I just started a yeast lab. Uh <laughs> Um, and then eventually um, started it up in uh, Nashville, um, and that's where it's been our home um, since 2013. Um, and it's been a wild ride of trying to find new cultures and share them with the world. And that bank, that collection, uh, the commercial availability, it's its really unique. There's uh, a lot of eclectic strains. I really just want to kind of open the floor to you to talk about some of your more popular strains um, uh, and especially the ones that we're planning on carrying and what kind of things you hear from home brewers that they are doing with them. I know you guys track like awards when home brewers win awards with your strains, as well as pro brewers are really good at coming back and telling uh, the other side of that story, which is rad. Uh, yeah. Tell me some of your rock stars in, in the collection. Yeah. So um, I just got to first off say that, you know, it's super cool that we're working with Northern Brewer because I was just thinking the other day is, when I was working my boring desk job, um, you know, reading about the latest kits that came from Northern Brewer was like one of the highlights, um, digging through those recipes um, that really inspired my brewing. And we were, you know, started by home brewers. I was a home brewer. Um, so that that's definitely been a big push for us is to take care of the homebrew community, um, give the tools um, to make the best beer possible to home brewers, And that's kind of guided our strain selection. So like, I think our most popular strain of all time has and continues to be Oslo. And so that was a Norwegian quite culture um, that we isolated actually from bottle dregs that we got from our Norwegian, Norwegian brewery, Eikentid um, in Oslo, um, who are good friends of ours. It was like the first clean fermenting Kauai. You could knock out a batch of beer in 18, 24 hours, super clean. Um, I think you could fool a lot of people as to whether it's a lager. Um, a lot of people don't believe me, but uh, the Pepsi Challenge 
has been done with that strain. <laughs> and unfortunately, there was a ton of people I know who were going to enter uh, loggers um, into NHC in 2020. And obviously that that got uh, derailed by COVID. But um, that's one of those strains that it works really well for home brewers. Because if you don't have temperature control, man, like you can pitch that at 100 degrees. You don't even have to cool it down. So you're like in a hot part of the country like that that's just an ideal thing for home brewers but even pro brewers love it too because they can just they can churn beers out um when they have really tight production schedules so that's been super cool to share that with the world when you say uh lager pseudo lager it's a strain that's also fine to go into ales it's not just for mimicking lagers right oh yeah totally and you know what's funny is like we were trying to find a strain to make hazy IPAs with quickly. That, <laughs> that was the original goal. And actually the first <laughs> brewery to commercially use that was our mutual friend in Denver. And we debuted it at uh, CBC um, and they made a hazy IPA. It was a collab with them and Sapwood Cellars and us. And we made a hazy IPA and we we're like, this is so great. And then all of a sudden people started making clean beers with it. And we were just like, wait, what? <laughs> or like neutral beers, you know? Um, so that's what I love about it is it gets out of the way. So if, if you're trying to make a beer style that doesn't need to be super yeast forward, that doesn't necessarily need to be estery, you can make a ton of IPAs that don't get a lot of um, yeast esters, but are just really hot forward. Um, some people like a neutral yeast character in their IPAs, but I've had people make porters, stouts, um, basically any kind of style that isn't like a hef or a saison where you need some kind of specific yeast character that's to style. It really works well. So for some people, it's kind of like a house strain for them. And if someone wants to go hazy, you guys have two really good options, right? We've got the Nipa and the classic New England. Yeah, those have been fun because... Um, Nipa was our attempt to say, okay, we want to come up with the perfect hazy IPA culture. And instead of like genetically engineering something, we wanted to say, hey, let's get all the cultures that we think make good IPAs and test them all out and come up with the best beer possible. And we did a ton of testing, so many different strains individually so many different strains blended together. Um, and the blend in Nipa was our favorite and it's just done really well um, because it's a little bit different. There's just not exactly the same as other strains that are commercially used for IPAs. Um, Five Burrows Brewing, um, they're in New York. They won a medal for a session hazy IPA using Nipa blend. That's their kind of like house strain for IPAs. Um, so it's it's been commercially tested. Homebrewers have been using it for years. Um, but kind of like a sleeper hit for us is our classic New England. That's become just like a monster. It is a Conan type strain, but it's a little bit different. Um, we've had just some really big advocates for that strain who say like, yeah, I've tested all the IPA strains. I've tested all the Conan strains. This one's a little bit different. A home brewer just won um, gold at NHC this year with that strain. Um, and it was actually really funny because he was like, I was actually using a different lab's culture and that got me past the first round. And then I was like, I'm just going to use this. I've heard good things. Um, so he was like, <laughs> it was a huge risk. Like he literally brewed a different beer. <laughs> for his... Called an audible at the end. Yeah. Of the fourth yeah. Quarter. I mean, that could have been a horrible mistake and I, you know, it went well for him. And that's cool because for us, it's like, we are not using the fanciest tools. I think bootleg, as a lab is people who love beer and care about beer and want, we want to bring strains that are just different and unique. And it's really just like a, um, a curated collection of cultures that we think are unique and different. It's not just cookie cutter. Um, we're not, uh, you know, digging into the genetics of these strains. We are just really trying to find something that's fun and unique and different and stuff that we like to drink that makes beer that we like to drink. What about something maybe a little bit on the, spicier farmhouse funky side year round well that's fun man because saison parfait um is our first saison culture and it just keeps doing well 
That one is also another cool blend that we did. It's like, we love blends because it's like strains by themselves are awesome, but there's just something really unique that you can get from blending. Sam, who's one of our partners, he actually did a presentation at HomebrewCon one year on blending these strains. Um, if you're a member, you could check out his presentation, but it's, it's a really cool way of tweaking attenuation levels, fermentation temperatures. It's not just about flavor profiles, but Parfait is awesome because I think it gets the really nice estuary notes of like a French Saison type culture, um, but some like classic spice and uh, drier attenuation of some of the more traditional like DuPont style. Um, and it doesn't even include those cultures. They're just random Saison strains <laughs> that we uh, put together and it's done really well. And this is kind of like a brewer's culture. You know, I wish Saison was like the number one beer style in America. I think 10 years ago, we all hoped that was going to be the case, but people who love good beer, I think love Saison and Saison Parfait is just something you just can't get anywhere else. Obi Belgian um, is our other Belgian culture that y'all are carrying. Um, that one is a monster. Um, and I think I'm just like listening off awards, like I'm the one who won them, but um, I think someone did really well with that. Yeah. I think last year someone won um, and with a Belgian single uh, at NHC using OB Belgian. That one's actually my favorite for making Belgian triples because it's like a beast. Um, you can knock out a Belgian triple in just a matter of days because this, this thing eats sugar like there's no tomorrow. Um, and it just tastes really nice, right? Really delicate. Um, and I would say it's actually kind of dangerous. It should come with a, you know, warning label because it will never drink like a high ABV beer. So if you make a triple and you want it to taste like a single, you can use that strain um, and you will definitely enjoy the results. <laughs> what about something like Funk Weapon? Yeah, dude. Uh, we <laughs> want the funk. We love the funk. Uh, it might be something that people know us for. Although, Ow. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> um, our friend Brandon Jones, he goes by Embrace the Funk. Uh, it's hard not to love the funk. Um, and I think there's a place in funk in all brewing. Um, you know, most of the cultures we do now are actually just clean um, yeast cultures for lagers and IPAs. But like something like Funk Weapon 2, which is going to be at Northern Brewer, that is like my favorite Brett strain because it's hard not to make a really nice, juicy, tropical beer with that strain. We have breweries that'll co-pitch that, which is like their house Saison strain. And in like six weeks, there's like no Saison character whatsoever. It's just all tropical fruit, like overripe orange and mango. Um, so it is not for the faint of heart. If you don't like tropical flavors, don't use that one. Most of us do <laughs> on some level. Um, it feels like you're drinking uh, funky orange juice. Uh, I definitely want to talk about, uh, you kind of referenced a lot of pro brewers who use your stuff and do great success, um, but talk about working with breweries such as, say, Jester King and working together to bring a house culture from a brewery to make it available for home brewers. That's so cool. And it's super special. And um, I think I feel very lucky that just through friendships in the beer world that we've just, we've gotten to know these people, um, you know, and it's like, it's hard not to just put them all up on a pedestal and go, I love your beer, dude. Um, but Jeff Steppings from Jester King has actually been kind of like a fan of bootleg since the beginning. Uh, he actually bought like a t-shirt, like when bootleg was just still <laughs> in my kitchen, you know? Um, and that I can't tell you how great that made me feel. And he's just kind of supported us. You know, they have a very similar mission, um, trying to focus on brewing local. They use a ton of local ingredients. Um, we love local beers, you know, and that includes local yeast. So we came up with the idea of like, hey, there's a lot of just really cool mixed cultures out there that no one has ever really touched outside of the brewery. And maybe we can share those with home brewers and even professional brewers and go, hey, you know how you try to like culture a beer from bottle dregs? You're actually missing out on some of the awesome cultures because a lot of those that started off in the beer, they just die out. You know, whether it's just time, the alcohol, the low pH, 
Mm -hmm. um, oftentimes what you get in a bottle is maybe just like the bread because like bread is like the terminator and it doesn't want to die mm -hmm. um so we were like hey jester king brace the funk some of these other breweries that we really respect like can we get your actual culture from an active fermentation and then share that with the world and i gotta admit like it's pretty much been a hundred percent rate on anyone we asked they were like yeah let's do it like no no hesitation it was just like, where can we send the culture and be like, no, no, no. We actually have to sign some paperwork. I think I got to talk to a lawyer, but like, <laughs> it's like they're ready to do this before we've even like talked business stuff, I guess. Um, and that's, that's cool. That's, that's the beer world. It's about sharing. And I think Jester King's culture is really special. Um, it's not just a bunch of things thrown together. It's something that they've curated themselves over time. And it really makes some really nice special beers, like some really approachable, moderate, lightly funky, lightly tart beers. Um, I really love that culture. If you just want to have a nice house saison, house mix culture. Um, and I think their beers, you know, are a great proof of how good that culture is. Um, and you can make beers like them. You can't make it exactly like it, <laughs> but you can make kind of like it with that culture. Kind of lastly, uh, you guys have your own in-house Solera project and then strains come born from that essentially. And it's kind of, it's treated almost like a seasonal or limited edition, right? Kind of talk me through how that project even came to be and how the, how the flow of strains from it works. Well, that, that's a fun one because I remember when I was thinking about starting a bootleg, I was like, I just had this idea of like, okay. So Soleras are kind of like this living thing, right? There's never just like, these are the cultures we put in this and it's always a fresh pitch. And it's like, what if we try to do a lab equipment or a lab version of a Solera? Meaning it's always changing. It's always mutating. There's always fresh new cultures and the dominant culture is changing over time. Um, is that possible? And I remember telling people like that and they were like, that's never going to work. Uh <laughs> <laughs> mainly uh, because people want repeatability or they just yeah. didn't think it would keep putting out something tasty consistently enough for you to release it uh, the way you do. I think it was probably both. And, but when you're like starting up, you know, you can't really go wrong because right. when you have like zero sales, it's like, Oh no, am I going to get negative sales? Yeah. Whatever <laughs> happened to that project? I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> but it's it's consistently been a really popular culture for us because three times a year we release a new version of it. Um, it started off with a bunch of random cultures we had. Um, it actually started off in a barrel um, and then we would pull off a sample from that active fermentation um, and then propagate that. Um, and then every four months we would add new cultures. And that is just like whatever is new and exciting to us. There's not like any specific reason. It's just like, man, we love this culture. Let's see what it does in this Solera. Um, so there's a lot of just like, you know, let's hope for the best and see what it does. Um, but then at some point we were just like, this is crazy that we're managing a, a prop pop, ugh, propping a culture out of a barrel. And then as people started ordering more of it, it's like, Oh no, we're going to run out of slurry. <laughs> Yeah. So we had to like, eventually we had to bank it, but then each successive Solera um, inoculates the next one with the new cultures. So it is always evolving, but it is always inoculated with the previous version of Solera. So it's mm. always going to be a little bit different. Um, and we've done side-by-side -side testing. We've done special editions where we went through and rebrewed with every single version of it and picked oh. our favorites yeah. Um, and they change and you can see the evolution with time. It's really fun. Yeah. What's kind of how over the the project, uh, how would you say that change has kind of ebbed and flowed? Like, where is it gone? Well, I think initially it came off uh, very sour because the I think the initial blend had a ton of PDO in it. Um, and you could see those initial um, batches were just incredibly sour because the PDO was just like a dominant culture. But I think once we finally moved it out of the barrel, um, there was less of an environment for the PDO to dominate. Um, so what I think I've seen is there's been kind of interesting ebb and flows based on seasonality. Um, like in colder temperatures, it seems like we get 
um, or more restrained Saison character. And then in summer months, we, we seem to get more dominant Saison. Um, it's kind of interesting because I'm like, okay, it's a, it's alive and it's living. Um, I don't have full control over it. Uh, if it escapes from the lab, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but the it has Solera been, that ate Nashville. Yeah. That ate Nashville. Uh, <laughs> um, but it has been a really good one for professional breweries too. So I think if you're a home brewer, you're like, I want to start a Solera project. I always say, Hey man, start with the latest sour Solera and then build your house culture from that because we know these bugs are good, but you know, you need to add to it, you know? So if we sell it to a professional brewery and they're inoculating a fooder, I always say, man, add something of yours in there. Maybe it, even if it's just bottle dregs or something else, hmm. try to get a wild capture from something in your local area and pitch that in. Um, so, you know, you have some good bugs in there, but you're going to create a new culture that'll change over time and make it yours from there. That's usually my recommendation. Jeff, that was a lot of great info, a lot of good usage ideas. Uh, we here are definitely stoked to have the strains where William has been chomping at the bit to get into the brew cave uh, and start working on some of these, uh, maybe even kid ideas, but definitely the recipe ideas that you have provided and that we've found other people have and tracking down, you know, NHC winners and GABF winners. So we're <laughs> excited as heck. We're looking forward to the future. Jeff, appreciate all your hard work and uh, kind of changing the game a little bit for home brewers. Uh, these strains are available at northernbrewer.com. Come check out what bootleg is slinging. Thanks so much, Jeff. Thank you. This has been awesome. Whoa, bootleg biology! <laughs> <laughs>